Hi, it's not Jan Beta, and today we are going to be doing some cleaning. Nice. Maybe I should steer clear of impressions. This is part two of the Amstrad CPC 6128 series. So in the previous part, I added RGB SCART with full compatibility with monitors that want the fast blanking and function switching signal. Uh, a few people commented on the last video. Thank you. Um, yes, there is a cable available from Retro Computer Shack. Unfortunately, he doesn't actually post those SCART cables to Australia for whatever reason. So I kind of went my own way with that. To be honest, I didn't really look at that before building my own cable. So um, yeah, I wasn't fully aware of it anyway. And um, I got most of the way through building that cable until I realized that, you know, it didn't work with the um, LCD monitor that I had. So I decided to press on. Um, that's kind of what this whole series is about, I guess. Uh, a lot of this stuff I don't know about the CPC, so uh, I kind of just did my own thing here. And today we're going to look at installing an internal GoTech and also getting the floppy disk drive to work off just a single 5 volt power supply. So let's jump straight back into that. Oh, and uh, the original monitor it does handle having five volts sent in on the sync line. It obviously doesn't like it. Um, you just lose sync. But I did actually test it just in case I forget to flick the switch the right way on the Amstrad and accidentally send five volts into it. It, um, yeah, it handled it just fine. And obviously I wouldn't recommend doing it for an extended period, but uh, pretty much as soon as I turned it on, I realized that there was an issue. So it's just a case of flicking that switch the right way for it. Anyway. Let's carry on with part two. So for the disk drive, I have two options. One of them is to keep the original disk drive and try and make it work with just the single five volt supply coming in. The other option is to replace the internal disk drive with a GoTech. I'm gonna demonstrate both. Let's go with the simple option first, which is just sticking a GoTech in place of the original. So with the original drive out, we're left with the power supply and obviously some data connections. Now keep in mind, this isn't the standard floppy disk drive size, so there's not enough pins to actually fill up a regular floppy disk connector. So for that, I either needed to make my own cable or use this adapter. Uh, thanks to good mate Randall, uh, he gave me a CPC to GoTech adapter. This is designed to fit in the 6128 and replace the original drive with a GoTech. I'm not sure where to find these, but it does say kmtech.co.uk. So I guess start there if you're looking for this thing. The other option is you can actually make your own ribbon cable. Uh, there are instructions for that that I saw online. You just need to sort of split certain signals uh, to different parts of the floppy disk connector. So this should simply plug in here. There are some jumpers. I'm not sure if I've got them set right, but I guess we're about to find out. Plug in power. Plug in our floppy ribbon cable. Oh yes, and uh, Jason, Mr. Lurch also printed me up a little mount so that it can sit where the original floppy drive was. Let's just try it out without all that first. All right, let's see. That is not RGB. That, that's the Luma and Sync coming through. That's RGB. But I'm not seeing any activity on the GoTech drive. And I think I know why. I think the five and 12 volts on this is reversed. That's not good. Um, just unplug that for a second. So that side is saying zero volts. And the other side is 4.7 thereabouts. So yeah, that's actually flipped around. So it's saying zero volts on this side because that would normally be where our 12 volts is. But on the GoTech, it wants to have five volts on the left, 12 volts, even though it doesn't need it, on the right. So this needs to be flipped that away. And that's gonna create an issue. Right, I sort of 
managed to get it in there just, but yeah, I'd probably just flip the pins around on the actual connector rather than trying to jam it in. But it looks like our GoTech lives. Um, let's just do cat. Yes, um, I guess that's James Bond, view to kill. Um, how do I load stuff again? Load, load, view, kill. Memory full. Run. Aha! Um, no. that's the internal speaker. Let's see if we... There we go. Turn that down. Cool. A game other than Beachhead. Probably need a joystick, but yes. GoTech seems to work. That's awesome. Oh, A, B, or C. You probably can't see it on camera, but the GoTech is Searching through tracks, doing its thing. Bench supply is friggin' noisy. Um, yes, the cassette. Dun, 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 dun. Will I get a copyright strike for that? Probably the point where I need a joystick, but yes, it seems to work. So if you're not too worried about having the original disk drive in there, you can mount a GoTech internally. And this case I assume is available somewhere online. Um, yeah, like I said, Jace just printed it up, but uh, I guess I could gut the GoTech and move the, uh, I guess that's a USB slot. So move the screen around and the knob and everything. I don't actually plan to do that because I really want to keep the original drive in there and working and have the GoTech external. So let's see how that's done. So the original drive is back in place. Now, how do we go about supplying it with the 12 volts that it needs when we've only got five volts coming into the system? With one of these, this is a little DC boost converter board. So it's going to take five volts in and hopefully spit 12 volts out. Just need to figure out where to put it. So before I try and mount this permanently, I'm just going to do a quick test with it. So just a few alligator clips here. V in, so we need to connect that to a five volt source. I know this is definitely a five volts over here. And V out is going to connect to where the 12 volt connector was. We just need to double check which pin on this connector is ground. All right, pin on the left is ground. So that is gonna to connect to the pin on the right. And I might put a little bit of heat shrink over the other side just so I don't short anything there. And that is ground. And the other side is also ground. I don't even know if I need to hook both sides up, but may as well. Let's hook them onto the floppy disk chassis. So before I go just connecting things up to the disk drive, I probably should just check what voltage it's gonna put out first. Oh, uh, it was set to 27 volts. Uh, so yeah, that wouldn't have been good. How do I 
I hope it's not broken. Oh, there we go. So yes, there's a little trim pot here to adjust the output voltage. Stay. All right, 12 volts, good. Currently drawing 1.41 amps. All right, let's try beachhead. Run disk. Go. Nope. What happened there? Huh. I think the power supply is going into overcurrent protection. It's allowing up to well, five amps now, so that's quite substantial. Hmm. The disk drive is actually spinning this time. It could just be poor grounding. Maybe I shouldn't use all of this as ground. Ah, this looks better. But yeah, it is causing some flickering in the video. Come on. Keep loading. So yeah, not a huge current draw. It's popping up to about 1.8, 1.9 amps. So I think just if I ditch these fairly dodgy alligator clips and connect everything properly, I think we'll be fine. And hopefully that'll fix up the flickering video that I noticed. But yeah, disk drive is working and we're running the CBC just off five volts. All right, so after poking around at the board a little bit and looking at the schematics, I've got a plan. So it appears that the original 12 volt supply also feeds the uh, cassette port, which is over the edge of the board over here. Uh, I think there's some little op amps and stuff that it actually powers. So again, I wanna keep this as fully functional as possible. So I originally thought to just have the 12 volts just connected straight to the disk drive and that'd be it, but uh, it actually goes through some transistors before it makes it over to the disk drive. So I wanna use the original 12 volt pin header on the board. And that brought me to another idea. I'm gonna keep this on the machine. And the difference is it's gonna live inside the machine. Uh, that at least saves me from putting this cable somewhere and then forgetting why, where I put it or what it is. So what I'm gonna do is kind of just route it out here maybe around that little post. And on our DC booster board, I've added a female DC barrel jack. Uh, just came out of the random parts drawer. So it is a little bit, uh, not exactly suited for purpose, but I made it work. So that is now gonna plug in here on the output. And for the input, I was looking at a place where I could grab five volts off the board, but I figured the best spot is actually at the switch. So after the power comes in and turning the switch on obviously powers the board. So I wanted to grab it from the switch to avoid any issues with drawing so much current from one of the five volt rails. So uh, grabbing it at the switch before it heads to everywhere else seems like the best idea. So that can just pop back in there. And then all we need to do is connect up the ground. Now I did notice a little spot on the board just here uh, that's unpopulated, a nice little ground pad just for us. So I'm thinking ground can sit right there. Soldering iron is struggling a little bit. I'm only at 360 degrees, so 
a little bit of work to get it flown, but that looks pretty good, I think. Give it the wiggle test. Yep, that is solid. Now, I don't really want this thing floating around. Thankfully, there's an easy fix for that. Le cable die. There's a little clip that holds all the disk drive cable here. So, do a bit of that and try not to get it lost in all those cables. And that is our 12 volt booster board installed. It's got a little bit of play to it, but it's actually hooked around that uh, plastic hook in the case. So it's not going anywhere and it's gonna be easy to remove. Uh, I haven't yet cleaned up the case. So I do still wanna be able to take all this apart. So I didn't wanna stick it to the actual case itself. Right, so let's do another quick test. Uh, I've tried to make sure all of this is visible just in case something exciting happens uh, without uh, damaging the very probably fragile ribbon cable on the keyboard. Bench power supply is on. Let's power this on. Oh yeah, uh, I flicked the switch back. Cool, everything is working. That looks good. Let's run disk. I think Beachhead is still in there. So I do still get a tiny flicker on the screen during disk drive access. Um, I'm not that concerned, I guess. Yes. The disk drive appears to be working just fine. Now, I'm a little bit curious about the current draw required. And it looks like shoring up those power connections, so not relying on crappy alligator clips, has helped out with the current draw. So bench supply is currently limited at 2.8 amps. And disk drive appears to be working fine. If I drop that to 2.7, machine resets when it tries to access the disk drive. So obviously that surge of power when the disk drive motors start up uh, is causing the machine to lose too much power and reset. So at the moment we need about 2.8 at 2.8 amps at five volts for it to be stable. But yeah, it really is just that initial burst when the disk drive and I guess the stepper motor, both motors start at the same time. Apart from that, it's pretty happy at 1.9 amps when the disk drive is actually accessing. But obviously there's a little spike there somewhere. So really the only other thing to do is work out how to hook up the disk drive externally. For this, um, we're gonna use obviously the external floppy connector on the board here, uh, but this doesn't actually provide any power on it. Again, I wanna keep this as neat as possible. So we're actually gonna work out a way to run everything through one cable, and that's gonna require me removing the main board so I can access the underneath. So while I've got that out, may as well take the opportunity to clean this thing up. So tear down of this system was fairly simple. Uh, the board came out quite easily. I think there's only four screws holding it in. And then you just need to disconnect a few cables here and there. The keyboard was a little bit trickier. The, um, the actual keys themselves have two clips sort of opposite sides of each other. So they sort of clip into the plastic piece underneath. Now I was trying to pull off all the keycaps without having to remove the backing plate, but that didn't really work out anyway because the longer keys have stabilizer bars and you need to pull off the backing plate in order to get those out anyway. So uh, 
If you're gonna pull apart one of these keyboards, it's probably easier just to remove the backing plate and then pop all the keycaps out from the back. All of the springs appear to be the same. It's only the spacebar that had two slightly smaller gauge springs holding it in. So you wanna keep those two separate, but the rest of them you can just pull out and throw in a jar. Now, in order to clean up the keycaps themselves, I did have to pull the little springs out of the back of the keycaps. The best way I found to do this was to pull the spring out just a little bit and twist it clockwise and keep pulling on it. You don't want to put too much strain on it because then you'll bend the spring out of shape and that could lead to all sorts of troubles down the line. So that was how I tackled the keyboard. I did also check out the main board specifically to make sure all the solder joints look good and to check out some of the electrolytic caps. And there were a couple that I've marked as suspect. Um, they tested a bit odd in circuit, but I'm gonna test them again out of circuit, see if they test normal after that. The disk drive, I also had a look at the caps in there. Uh, they all seem fine and Mr. Lurch replaced the belt uh, when he first got this machine. So no need to worry about anything with the disk drive. And I also pulled apart the joystick while I was at it uh, to give that a clean out. It's kind of interesting. I thought because it was an Amstrad joystick, it's got the second port for the secondary joystick. I thought it would have two separate fire buttons. It does have two fire buttons, but they're both wired to fire one or fire A. Uh, some Amstrad games use a secondary fire button and the Amstrad is capable of obviously handling that, but the joystick itself, both fire buttons are wired to the same thing. So uh, that's a bit of a disappointment, but either way, I'll clean it up. It uses those little tactile dome switches. And what's kind of interesting, I noticed they were fairly clicky and that's because they've actually stuck two dome switches together on each uh, you know, direction or fire button. So that's kind of an interesting thing because the Atari joysticks that I've pulled apart before, they obviously use dome switches as well but they just use one of those single domes, whereas uh, the Amstrad one has two and it makes a good, nice, clickier feel to it. So maybe that's something I'll do in the future for, you know, budget joysticks. So the case itself got a wipe down and a good scrub. I didn't actually submerge this one because I don't know how the uh, labels handle being submerged in water for too long. So I didn't want to risk it and find out. And um, yeah, I think the only thing that sort of rubbed off was the serial number. To be honest, I'm not even sure if that was on there to begin with. I don't remember seeing the actual serial number, so it may have already rubbed away. After that, I decided to try out some of this stuff. It's the Chemical Guys Vinyl Rubber Plastic Protectant. I'm obviously not sponsored by these people. Uh, usually I use the 303 UV protectant, but I'm running low on that, so I spotted this at the auto parts store the other day and it was on sale, so I picked some up. And to be honest, it seems to have done a pretty good job. So I guess we'll do a before and after once I get all the keycaps reinstalled. Speaking of which, here they are here. They've also been cleaned up and I took them over to Mr. Lurch's place for a little bit of retro brighting treatment because they were a bit yellowed. I think there's still just a slight hint of yellowing, but yeah, definitely a lot better than how they were before. So we'll get those reinstalled, um, but let's just check out the caps on this main board and then we'll wire it up for the external disk drive. Yes, and the ground cable for the disk drive came straight off the board. It looks like it was hardly even soldered on to begin with. So I uh, guess it's not a huge surprise. Could explain why I was having issues before with the disk drive being powered off this buck converter, but using the disk drive chassis as the ground because it's all going back pretty much along this cable. All right, so what I've done is marked a little line between the caps that I wanted to test out. So there's a couple over here in the audio section by the looks of it. And there's this one here, which looks to be the main capacitor where the power comes in. So it's reading at 178 microfarads with a dissipation factor of 0.42, which is quite high. Usually you want to look for, I guess it's under 0.1 as the dissipation factor when you're using these kind of meters, especially set to 120 hertz. The dissipation factor is similar to ESR. It sort of takes ESR into account along with a bunch of other factors, I believe. And that's how you come up with your measurements. So it's in a way a little bit more accurate than just looking at the ESR on its own. 
So I'm pretty sure this cap is in parallel with a bunch of others. So it probably will test fine once we actually lift a leg from the board. So we're now seeing 48 microfarads with a D value of 0.097. So yep, I am happy with that for a 47 microfarad cap. And yeah, it's just all the other stuff in parallel to it that was giving us a weird reading. So the next one was this 16 volt 100 microfarad. Let's just see. So we're getting 105 microfarads, but the dissipation factor is 0.288, which does seem a little high. Yeah, that looks much better. 95 microfarad with a D value of 0.056. Right, so after checking out some of the caps on the board, I'm happy to say that they all appear to be in spec. So no need to worry about any leaking electrolytics here. Hmm, better reattach this while I'm thinking about it. All right, so the joystick got a clean up and a reassembly. I did replace the little dome switches. I only went with one switch per uh, direction because trying to get two dome switches to sit on top of each other while you try and tape them down with Kapton tape isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. So one each, but the buttons feel nice and clicky again. So that's a good sign. So after a lot of case cleaning and key scrubbing and key retro writing, thanks again, Jason, this is how the machine looks. Um, yeah, very shiny. The key caps are almost perfect. I think there's a couple over here that look to be a little bit more yellowed. So maybe some sunlight was hitting it on this corner, but I'm certainly happy with that. So I'm certainly happy with the result of cleaning this thing up. Uh, coming up next, we'll look at how to run the external GoTech on this thing using only a single cable uh, and obviously still having the original drive work just as it should. So that's coming up in part three. As for now, a massive thanks to all of you for watching. Huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. And of course, please feel free to leave comments uh, down below. Let me know what you think. And um, don't forget to like, subscribe and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I will catch you all in the next one. Bye.